from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Hi everybody, my name's Nick. I get the joy of being the lead pastor of City on a Hill in Melbourne's eastern suburbs. And today, the privilege of opening the Bible with you. Given all that's going on, it is a joy to gather online today. And if there's a silver lining to what's happening, it is that you and I are part of history. The first Easter in all of human history that is being celebrated online around the world right now. And so wherever you're at, thank you so much for tuning in and joining with us today. I don't know what you've been watching to pass the time uh, in these shutdown days, but if your Netflix is anything like mine, then it is full of recommendations of post-apocalyptic, dystopian, sci-fi thrillers and Tiger King. Uh, Recently, Jules, my wife and I were watching one of those post-apocalyptic dystopian sci-fi thrillers called I Am Mother. The film follows a girl called Daughter who has been born and raised by a robot named Mother. She's been born and raised in a a bunker there to protect Daughter as Mother seeks to repopulate the earth after the planet was wiped out from an extinction event. And so daughter's lived her whole life inside this bunker with the belief that the outside world is barren, it's dangerous. Out there, there's no chance of survival. And that's all well and good until one day, daughter hears a scream outside of the bunker. There's a woman out there banging on the bunker, asking for her someone to let her in. And so daughter lets her in, this stranger enters into the bunker and she enters in with a whole different story about what's going on out there. For the woman, the outside world is dangerous, all right, but it's dangerous because the robots have taken over. An army of robots have caused humanity to flee underground. I won't spoil the ending for you, but from that point on in the movie, Daughter is at this point of tension. On the one hand, here's this stranger who's come in from the outside, offering her a story of of great hope of what's going on out there, what might be possible, that there is hope beyond the bunker, And on the other hand, inside is mother. The familiar voice telling her, no, no, this is all there is. This is where you belong. And so who should she believe? Who should she trust? Who is telling the truth? Now, you probably agree with me that the working assumptions of our culture right now have have trained us toward embracing a, a particular narrative about this world that we're living in right now. One where uh, the relevance and the reality of God, of faith and of the spiritual world have kind of taken a back seat to be replaced more and more by a worldview made up only of things that we can experience in the here and now. But in many ways, we come together this Easter and we find ourselves in a similar position to daughter. Every year at Easter, we hear the equivalent of a stranger entering into our world from outside, giving us a new narrative, a new story about what is really important in the world. A different narrative about the purpose of the world, about the meaning of our lives, about who is at the center of that story. And so the tension that we have to come to grips with this Easter is who are we going to listen to? Who are we going to trust? Who is telling the truth? Now, for us, particularly this Easter, 
turn on a global pandemic and we now find ourselves scrambling for hope beyond this world and yet we find ourselves within a bunker about which we've been told this is all there is. And so today we're going to look at a seemingly random story from three and a half thousand years ago, tucked away in the backwoods of the Old Testament. But this story is going to open up for us, expose for us who we really are. It's going to point us to someone that we can trust and it's going to point us beyond to a hope that we can find. And so I'd love if you have the opportunity to have a Bible with you, whether it's a physical one open with you or you want to get your smartphone out or even open up another tab and follow along with us. We're going to be in Numbers 21. We're going to look through this story and see what it has for us. And so turn with me to Numbers 21 verse 4. We read this. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. Let's stop there for a moment and, and catch up with a little bit of a history lesson. You might know that people of Israel were in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. And they are getting flogged in Egypt, beaten. They are enslaved. They have no freedom at all. And so they start crying out to God for him to come and do something. Well, God, hears them. You might know that he, he calls a man named Moses. He raises up Moses to help his people be released from under the Egyptians. Yet there's one problem. The Egyptian Pharaoh does not want a bar of it. And so God himself has to intervene. And so he sends plagues to come down upon Egypt for their hard heartedness. And finally, God's people are allowed to go. And so God walks them through the Red Sea. They're finally saved. God delivers them from slavery, promises them new land. He sets up a new constitution and he says, you are my people. And so everything they ever wanted, it's theirs. They're on their way from beans and rice to milk and honey. They have swapped the oppressive dictatorship of the Egyptian Pharaoh for the godly leadership of the prophet Moses. And now they're on their all expenses provided journey toward their brand new house and land packages in the promised land. And But let's read what happens next. The rest of verse 4 and 5. They're on their way and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. And so the people start to complain. They can still remember when they were enslaved. They probably still feel the pain of the shackles around their wrists and their ankles, their prayers, their longings still hang fresh in the air. And now they're saying, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? Essentially saying to God, God, what were you thinking? Freeing us from slavery. And we can sit back at, at some distance from this story and we can think, oh, how un grateful can you be this is ridiculous but the reality is we share a few things with these israelites and the main thing we share with them is the human heart see how many of us uh, which have had things in our own life for which we have have prayed for which we have longed for which we have worked hard to accumulate or achieve things about which we thought internally you know if i just had that then i would be at rest then i would be content and yet when it comes along, out comes the heart of Israel. Perhaps you're single and you pray fervently for a spouse, for a partner. God, please provide me a spouse, provide me a partner. And yet you get married and a few years later you start praying, God, why did you give me this spouse? Or you're praying for kids trying to fall pregnant. God, please give us a child. We would love a child to nurture, to care for. Then they get born and a few years later, you're praying, God, why did you give me these kids? Maybe it's the house or the apartment that you're living in. You move into a new house, you renovate the kitchen, it looks awesome, but now your bathroom looks tired and dated. And so you've got to spend some money updating the bathroom, but now you've got a new house, uh, sorry, a new 
kitchen and a new bathroom, you want to invite some people over. Let's have a housewarming party. And so you invite everyone over, but it's a bit squishy. And so you think, gee, maybe we need to extend the living room out the back. Let's, let's add a deck. And so you, you build a deck, but now you're going to be entertaining close to the backyard. So you've got to bring in a landscaper who's got to do all the garden and on and on and on it goes. We are forever pursued by our own discontentment. And yet no one's chasing us because it's all within. Whatever it is, our hearts have the uncanny ability to twist what was once a dream and turn it into a burden, to take what was once a gift and see it as an entitlement. Just last week, I was watching the movie A Quiet Place with Jules. Uh, It's a horror movie. Uh, and it's set in this time in the world where the world has been overrun by like these, these alien monster creatures who are going to come and tear you to pieces if you make a noise. That's a scary place. That's why it's called a, a, a quiet place. And as I'm watching these people try to survive in this environment, they're kind of protecting each other physically. They're sometimes hugging, sometimes embracing. I'm sitting there on my couch in a global pandemic. And I start thinking to myself, look at these guys all their physical touch and all their hugging and embracing and their lack of concern for airborne diseases. I would love to be in the world that they're in. I'll take that over where I am right now. You see, it doesn't matter what that thing is. It's not about the thing. The common denominator in all ungratefulness is the human heart. My heart, your heart, our hearts. We are naturally ungrateful and selfish. We naturally turn from thankfulness for all that we've been given, even if we've received it undeservedly, ill-deservedly, and instead we use it as evidence for what we're really missing out on. And so this is the story that the Bible reveals about who we are. That we are people made in God's image, and therefore we've got innate value and worth. On the one hand, like these Israelites, we have real responsibility. We want to be free. We have real relationships. We want to be together. We want to love and be loved. We want to get to our promised land where we can finally experience rest. Yet at the same time, we sabotage those longings because our hearts have turned in on themselves. Like Israel, our hearts have spoken against the Lord. And we've put ourselves at the center. And this is something that the world seems to discover again and again with each new passing generation. I've heard a a bunch of quotes from academics who have discovered this reality. I'll read some to you. In, In 1890, an English sociologist named Beatrice Webb wrote in her diary, I stake everything on the essential goodness of human nature. Well, 35 years later, she had lived a little bit, and so she referred back to that statement and corrected it. She said, I realize now how permanent are the evil instincts and impulses in us that mere social machinery will never change. Shortly after World War II, British historian Lord David Cecil wrote, the philosophy of progress had led us to believe that the savage and primitive was behind us. Well, it turns out that it was actually within us. And perhaps you've heard of Alexander Solzhenitsyn writing about Stalin's Russia. He said, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, then we could separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And so when we look at these Israelites complaining on their journey, we see that though they want to be free, they're actually enslaved, that you can take people out of slavery, but you can't take the slavery out of the people. And as we look at them, we also see ourselves walking our own journey in life, enslaved, locked in a bunker of our own making, trying by nature to turn everything toward our own ends. This is who we are. And so how does God respond as the people cry out like this? Verse 6 tells us, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. Fiery serpents. Now, these aren't some kind of magical snakes that God has concocted for the occasion as if he's like Dr. Evil, like get me sharks with laser beams on their heads. No, they're snakes and they're called fiery snakes because either they were red 
or because of the pain that their bite will have caused when they bit people. But God is using them to judge people for their rebellion. You see, this isn't just the Israelites complaining about not having some food that they would like. No, they have rejected the God who saved them. They are rebelling against the one who at his own initiative, by his own grace, brought them out of slavery and said to them, you're mine. I love you. And the Bible tells us of the consequence of that rejection. It's death. As the people whom God has lavished his love upon reject him, God says, okay, we'll have it your way. Your way leads to death. I don't know if your household is experiencing corona crazy uh, at the moment. During this pandemic, like many of you, I've been working from home. I've got a little nice two-by-two corner of my garage that I've uh, set up, and it's a big change, but it has allowed me some new insights, particularly insights into my children. I've got a four-year-old boy, Axel, a a one-year-old girl, Aria. Uh, They really take on the best and the worst of their parents. For the good, uh, my four-year-old boy, Axel, has adopted his mum's priority on cleanliness. She's always been uh, the cleanliness uh, one in the house. Uh, and so now he often makes sure that I'm, I'm sanitizing my hands when I need to, that I'm, I'm washing my hands. He's, he's concerned about people contracting the coronavirus. And so uh, he has that value. He's learned it from his mum. Yet for the bad, perhaps the most common phrase I've shared with Axel in the last three weeks is, Sorry, bud, I've got a meeting. Like I've been in a pandemic of Zoom meetings and we did have one episode that was a lot like the BBC experience where he kind of came in behind a recording of one meeting that I was in, but he's taken it in. He's heard what I've been saying to him. And so just the other day I was doing something and he he came up very excitedly to me and he said, dad, guess what? And I said, what is it, son? I had a meeting He had his own meeting. It turned out that he had had a FaceTime with some of his his kinder buddies and that was his meeting. Now, kids are so influenced, aren't they, by the environment in which they are in. But it's not just kids because those kids, my kids, they're going to grow up. And I can imagine that when Axel's kind of grown up a little bit and he's at one of his job interviews and uh, the interviewer is going to ask him, so Axel, tell us your your biggest weakness. He's probably going to say, hey, I'm really well sanitized, but I'm a workaholic. Because we learn how we're shaped and that becomes part of who we are. All of us as adults have been shaped in ways we think is our own preference and choice when really we've just adopted the priorities and the passions of either the people who brought us up or the environment in which we're in. Well, just as the Israelites' preference for Egypt in this moment was a symptom of their rejection of God, so too has that heart been passed down through the generations to the whole household of creation. We have not just bought into a story that kind of keeps God nudged out of the picture. Rather, we've been born and raised in and even built our own bunker to ensure God is out of the picture. And yet we're in this bunker and in it we suffocate because we're cut off from God, the source of life. And so you are, by virtue of being alive right now, in some sense, in a relationship with the God who made you, that he has created you in his image. But all of us, by nature and by choice, have rejected him. And the consequence of doing so is death. The Bible tells us that God created us with longings and desires that can only be fulfilled in him. And yet when we cut him out of the story of our lives, those longings and desires have nowhere to go, but rather to be turned in on themselves. And so we, by nature, we we cheerfully chase the fulfillment of our desires without ever stopping to think about the end. Where is all this actually going? And so perhaps the the panic of the Israelites as these fiery snakes slithered through the camp is somewhat like the panic that our world might be experiencing right now. We're confronted with the reality of our mortality. That painful and awkward realization that we will not live forever. That a lot of the things we've been grasping at and hanging on to and our priorities and passions in life are actually out of our control and can be taken away. Just like that, death is coming. And after that, we'll face judgment. 
But what if this shutdown moment was actually a gift to you? A gift where you can pause and reflect about what's actually going on in your heart, about what it is that your priorities are. You can pause and reflect and ask yourself, is what I'm living for right now worth it? Are the things I'm giving myself to things that will last? This heart that I've got, where is my heart leading me? What is going to hold me up when I come face to face with the God who I've ignored? And so our hearts are the same as these Israelites and our predicament is the same. How can we be saved? How can we have hope? Well, let's look at what happens next. The rest of our reading. Verse 7 says, And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who's bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And so the people do the one thing they know to do and have learned to do when they're in a crisis. They cry out to God, just like they did back in Egypt. They cry out for mercy. And the same God who saved them back then, the same God who was judging them right now, now turned and offered them a way of salvation. And notice how God brings salvation for his people. He instructs Moses to make a fiery serpent, to lift up that fiery serpent so that when anyone's bitten by a snake, they might look at it and be healed. They might look at it and be saved. And so the very thing that came as judgment in the first place, fiery serpents, God was now going to bring as the means of salvation. As Matthew Henry has said, that which cured was shaped in the likeness of that which wounded. And this is where more is added to the story of our lives. What if the very thing that is our judgment, what if the very thing that is our judgment for our rejection of God, death, was the very thing that God himself might use to lead to salvation from such judgment? What if that which was coming against us could be turned and actually used for us and for our healing, for our salvation and for our hope? Well, welcome to Good Friday. Because it's in that thought we arrive at the center of the story of the world and we see the one in whom we can trust. This is the center of the narrative that each and every year, Good Friday and Easter weekend, they come to tell us about what is really going on in our world, that who is at the center of the story and who it is that we can trust. Because, you know, 1,500 years or so after this little episode we're reading in the book of Numbers, Jesus of Nazareth was born. I don't know what you know or think about Jesus, what category you fit him in, in your view of history, but it's likely that you know that Jesus was renowned for being a teacher. We have the biographical accounts of Jesus uh, where we have moments where he was teaching and yet have moments too where he taught particularly about himself. And I want to look for a moment at one of those moments because in the book of John, Jesus has there a, a moment where he's had a late night conversation with a religious leader named Nicodemus. And they're talking about what is at the heart of our relationship with God, our heart. And they're talking about getting a new heart. And Nicodemus essentially asks him, how can this be? How can this happen, Jesus? And Jesus concludes his answer by bringing up our story. He says in John 3, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And Jesus is claiming something amazing here. Jesus is saying that just as in this story, Moses fashioned together a a fiery serpent that it might be lifted up and people could look at it and be healed. Jesus has come, taking on human flesh so that he might be lifted up in death 
and that we might have life. See, the story of the Israelites was a picture of something far greater, far more powerful, a picture to the world, a picture to you and a picture to me that in it we might see something that God wants to do for you. And what we're here to remember on Good Friday is that not long after saying this, Jesus would indeed be betrayed. Jesus would be flogged and beaten. Jesus would be mocked and spat upon. Jesus would be tried and Jesus would be sentenced to death upon a cross. That Jesus was very literally raised up, lifted up to die. And so his words to Nicodemus on this night, they make sense for us for what was actually happening on that first Good Friday, that the very thing that was a judgment upon us, Jesus is taking upon himself. The very thing that is coming against us, your death, my death, our spiritual death before God, Jesus was saving us from our own rebellion against God by coming to take that penalty that you and I deserve. That which cured was shaped in the likeness of that which wounded. And so this is the good news of Jesus. We can come to Jesus and live. We can come to Jesus, put our trust in him and be saved. But we ask, how can we know that for ourselves? How can we know that life? How can we, we be free from this, this bunker that we're in? How can we have new hearts to experience this for ourselves? Well, Jesus goes on. One of the famous verses in all of Scripture, John 3.16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so Jesus didn't merely die as a mechanism for you to be made right with God, as awesome as and incredible as that is. Jesus didn't only die as a substitute in your place for you so that you could be reconciled with the God who made you. It's incredible and as life-giving as that is. No, Jesus died to show you who God is. That there's a God out there. That there's hope beyond our world. That that God out there has come in here. He's had himself be born into this bunker. So that we might know him. And that we might experience him and his love for us in Jesus. In Jesus, God shows us that we are so messed up that we contributed to the crucifixion of the Son of God. Yet in Jesus, God shows us that we are so loved that Jesus willingly laid down his life in crucifixion, that we would know him. And so in the midst of a conversation with Nicodemus about how to get a new heart, Jesus says he has come to die. It's because Jesus' death shows us a love that changes our heart. Maybe you've heard of the, the classic story, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. This time I am going to give you the end of the story, but you've had 150 years to check it out yourself. So forgive me. The book ends with a dramatic scene. One man, Sidney Carton, breaks into a dungeon where a man who looks remarkably similar to him, Charles Darnay, is about to be executed. He's going to be guillotined. And so he takes Charles out, who has a, a wife and a child for whom he has affection for. And, and Sidney Carton sits there, waiting to be guillotined in his place. And there are a bunch of other prisoners around who themselves are waiting to be executed. And this seamstress comes close to Carton. She's waiting to be killed as well. And she sees this man that she thought was Charles Darnay. But the more she looks at him, the more she realizes, hey, this is this is somebody different. This is somebody else. And so she says to him, are you dying for him in his place? And he says, shh, yes, for him, for his wife and his child. And then she says something like, Mr. Stranger, I don't think I can face my own death, but maybe if I hold the hand of someone as brave as you, I'll be able to do it. You see, when we look to Jesus and his death, when we look to him and his love for us, we see a love that changes us. I don't know what you've encountered about Christianity in the past, but the message of Christianity is not for you and me to get our act together, change ourselves and start living life 
with and for God. But rather, it's to recognize that in Jesus, God has lived a life for you in your place. God has died a death for you in your place. God has loved you so much already that the only right response is to hold on to him, is to believe in him, to look to him, to put your trust in him. When we see that we're loved like that, suddenly chains start to fall away from our heart. What's turned inward can fan outward as we acknowledge that the most important things in our life have already been accomplished by Jesus for us. You have had your sin forgiven. You've had your debt paid. The judgment has already taken place. Jesus was standing there dying in your place for you. He has given you eternal life. You can have eternal rest. He has reconciled you with God who made you and designed you to be with him. And that's what I want for you today. That's what I want for you today. In this story we've looked at today, we see who we really are. But in it, we also see Jesus, the one that we can truly trust. We see his love, that it is our only hope beyond this world. We see his death in our place. We see all that he has given up and offered to us. And it's our opportunity to accept his invitation, to accept his offer. And so here we have a tale with two options. One is that we can continue to live in the bunker of our own making. It's safe. It's familiar. We can live life our own way. We can ignore where it might be taking us in the end. But the second option is we can look to Jesus today. We can put our trust in Jesus today. We can give our life to Jesus today. Because we see in Jesus, his life laid down for us. I want that for you today. That's the offer on the table for you today. And so let me encourage you to respond to God's invitation to you today. You can come and receive a new heart in Jesus, eternal life in Jesus, hope beyond the bunker of our world in and only in Jesus. He has proven himself worthy of our trust. Jesus is the one that we can listen to. And so please let us know if you'd like to accept that invitation today. If you're tuning in with us on our church online platform, cityonahill.digital, you've got an opportunity to to raise your hand, as it may be, uh, in the chat function there and to receive prayer from someone. We'd love to follow up with you. If you're tuning in on Facebook, then we'd love for you to put a, a big and hearty yes in the comments if you'd love someone to follow up with you and pray with you. We'd love to begin a conversation with you about Jesus today. We are here today so that you might know the hope that Jesus' death brings. It's a hope that I want you to experience. It's a hope that is going to hold us through whatever is to come for the rest of our lives. And so please don't move on from your device without that hope. You were made for this hope. It's a hope you can freely receive and a hope you can experience today. I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Gracious God, We thank you for your love for us in Jesus. We repent and are sorry for the ways we've lived our life apart from you. But we praise you for drawing us back, for dying in our place, for paying our debt, for taking on our judgment, for offering us new life. Open our hearts to be transformed by you. May we ever hold on to Jesus and may he be our hope today. In Jesus' name, amen.